it's, uh, it's a great, great honor to be here and to present. And uh, I will be talking today about uh, a, a variety of things. I'm going to motivate uh, and, and give you some general idea about why I think uh, computational investigations are important. And then what I'm going to do is talk specifically about how I've used computational methods in a particular theory of ontology. So that's really, and, and how it's uh, applied to epistemology as well. So um, the value of computational metaphysics, it's really very easy to, to say. Uh, you discover counter models to arguments and you detect errors in reasoning. You discover facts about the strengths of axioms and premises. You can confirm the consistency of your premises and find the smallest models of your metaphysical claims. You can derive interesting theorems and confirm valid reasonings. You can clarify epistemological issues in light of the metaphysical and logical results. And I'm going to try to, I hope there'll be time for me to do that. I'm going to try to reserve time for that. And then there's all sorts of interesting methodological issues about how you actually go about doing this, uh, using these automated reasoning engines. And, and I will give a few little demos if that will, if it seems like demos aren't working today, but we'll see whether uh, I can make mine work. Um, <clears throat> So now let me just generally state some of the interesting results that I think uh, have come about, and uh, at least in my own work, and also in the work of others and one other. I've worked with a lot of people, uh, and uh, these people, starting with Brandon Feidelson, who was a kid, basically, who showed up at Stanford, and he started telling me that he had worked a summer at Argonne National Labs uh, doing automated reasoning, and I said, well, I have an axiom system. Let's see if how that works. So, he taught me computer uh, uh, automated reasoning tools, and I taught him metaphysics. And together, we came up with this paper, Steps Toward a Computational Metaphysics. And we showed that the 25 theorems of possible world and situation theory in my paper in 93 were validly derived. That was a good thing. That was a sigh of relief. Uh, and I will talk just a little bit about the world theory later on. Um, for example, three of the theorems that are in that paper is that there's a unique possible world. You can define possible worlds in my theory of abstract objects and define what it is to be an actual thing. And then you can prove there's a unique possible world that's actual. And uh, you can prove the Kripke view that P is necessarily true of true at all worlds. And the Lewis view that P, P is possible, there's a world where P is true. Um, so those are really nice results. And, and I'll say a little bit more about them later. Um, we discovered also uh, in that paper that a biconditional theorem that we left as an exercise, that Jeff Pelletier and I left it as an exercise in our pap paper on Plato's theory of forms, uh, we shouldn't have done that. That was a mistake. We found an error. The right to left direction has a counter model. And MACE, which is a counter model battle building tool, found it. And Brandon and I discovered this as we were trying to reproduce the results in the paper in Pelletier and Zalta 2000. So that's kind of neat. Uh, that we found an error in, in reasoning. We basically left something as an exercise and we didn't consider the intentional case. We were thinking extensionally and that doesn't work. One of the other results we proved is that uh, the paper that um, Paul Oppenheimer and I published in 1991, which got reprinted in the Philosopher's Annual, where we argued that Anselm needs three non-logical premises to validly derive the, the existence of God. And we studied the, the prose logian very carefully and we formulated those premises, and, those, and that paper was stood out there for 20 years, and then we decided to try to represent those premises and the conclusion in Prover 9, and Prover 9 discovered that you don't need all three premises, given the way we formulated them. The first premise, the, the, the first premise or the, third, the second premise suffices. And so two of the premises were redundant. <laughs> and but, but there was a nice Polish logician, a really terrific Polish logician in Lublin who discovered, well, if you can derive it from one premise alone, then it isn't it equivalent to the, to the conclusion that God exists. And he quite rightly points out that what you should do is we could preserve that original paper simply by weakening that second premise in such a way then all three premises are needed. And it's a nice weakening. And if you're interested in that, I can tell you more about that. If not in the talk today, I can do it uh, after, afterwards. And uh, then, uh, so this was Garbach, uh, this is Pavel Garbach's paper. And then uh, uh, Christoph Benzmuller and his, uh, and his colleague uh, Wolfgang Bruno Paleo, they discovered that uh, when Dana Scott transcribed the Gobelsberger notation from Gödel's Nachlass on the ontological argument, Dana actually introduced a little correction. He didn't think much of it at the time. 
But they showed that without that correction, the axioms that uh, Gödel introduced uh, in his Lach Lachs for proving the existence of God suffer from modal collapse. And so uh, that, that was a nice result. It, uh, it was some, a humorous thing. When we published our things, I gave the talk about it at Rice University, and uh, Moshe Vardy was there. And at the time, he was the editor of the uh, 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 communications of the ACM. And he, put on, he thought that was a really interesting result. And he put a reporter on it. And the title of the article was uh, Deus Ex Machina. <laughs> and, uh, and in there, and, the, and Christoph Binsmuller, when he reported his results, the German newspapers got a hold of it. And the, and the main headlines were, computer scientists prove God's existence on a Mac. <laughs> so so, this is a, so this, there's a lot of nice things coming out of this. OK. Um, Another thing that came out uh, of all this work is that as we were implementing my theory of Leibniz's uh, concepts and his individual concepts and his modal metaphysics, uh, one of my colleagues, Jesse Alama, a young guy from Stanford, he developed a set of tools to help these first order reasoning engines to help us to prune stuff. And, the, and let me tell you what I mean by that. When you prove a conjecture, or a, or a conclusion that has deeply defined terms. Terms are defined in other terms that are defined in other terms, blah, blah, blah. And you, what you typically do include as premises all the definitions and axioms governing all the primitive and defined terms. You just throw them all in at once. And then you add the conclusion, and then you see if the machine can prove the conclusion from the premises. But often, not all of them are needed. In, in fact, most of the time, they're not all needed. And so what Jesse did, uh, in uh, 2012, and his TPTP tools was to uh, actually build a command line interface, a command line program, the TP program, which will go ahead and minimize these things. And uh, let's see if I can show you. There is a theorem that we proved that there are, exist uh, individual concepts. And if I go here and CD to the demo and then do this, uh, let me go back here. Can I copy this? Can I, all right, let me let me exit this. Ah, it's really small. I have to copy it from here. No, I can't copy it from there. So, so let me just say TPTP. TP uh, minimize theorem twenty nine dot orig dot p. Yes, is it working? You see it? Yes, there you go. So if I showed you the original source file, there's about 20, how many premises? Did it already say how many premises there were? Maybe 15 to 20 premises used to derive the conjecture. And what, what, what Jesse's script is doing is basically seeing, OK, what do I derive it from? And, can I der and once I've found a minimal set, can I derive it from any subset? And then he's just, as a proof stage, he also then says, if it's really a minimal set, then any smaller set I should be able to find a counter model so that you can show that the premises of that smaller set uh, uh, don't, in fact, derive the conclusion. And, and as you can see, then he come, it spits out, I don't know if you can read that, from the six used non-conjecture premises of the initial proof, the, the needed ones are in red. So then we could prune the files. And that was a really nice kind of uh, result. So, so Jesse's program is uh, uh, really worthwhile. If you want to see the source file, I'd be happy to show it to you. But anyway, so he, he developed both this, syntac this syntactic and a semantic test, check where in any subset of the premises can prove the conjecture, and then check uh, if a premise set is minimal, that each subset, in fact, leads to a, uh, a counter model. Everybody see how that works? It's a really nice command line interface. If you know a little Unix, you know how to run the terminal command in a Unix environment. Uh, you can download Jesse's tools. Uh, there's the URL right there. OK. And then uh, one of the things I did separately uh, was to use the front end of Prover 9 to show a very interesting fact that it was already known. Uh, Chris Woyer ha has published on it uh, in an earlier paper, and I think it's even someone else had published pre previously to him, that Leibniz's original calculus of concepts in a late paper uh, in 1690, what Leibniz does is he introduces, uh, he just takes concepts as primitive, and he has variables x and y, well, he has a at capital A, capital B, but in here, let's do it this way. And he introduces a summation operator, the sum of concepts x and y, and then he s defines a notion x is, include, is included in y, which, which means y contains the concept f. So we're now back in the con concept containment theory. And um, he uh, asserts that 
the concept summation is idempotent and commutative, and he defines concept inclusion this way, that is, x is included in y if there's a concept z such that the sum of x and z is equal to y. And then he starts proving things, and he proves things like Proposition 12, but it turns out you can't actually prove it from that premise set. He's left out associativity, but you actually reason with associativity. So here is another demonstration. Let me see if I can uh, do this. Uh, so let me escape out of here. Let me uh, find in here the demo. Do I have the, oh. Uh, so, you know, I think what I can do is grab this from the handout. Let me grab the, the there we go. So if I grab these three guys, there we go. Okay, and Proposition 12. Now I'm going to open up Prover 9. How many have seen the graphical interface to Prover 9? Nobody? Wow, okay. Well, I thought I was doing something that everybody would have seen before, but, but anyway, just to kind of remind you. But anyway, that, look how the premises, can you see how the, let me just show you the premises and the conclusion. Here's the goal. So basically, to say that concept summation is idempotent is to say for all x, the sum of x and x equals x. Pretty simple, right? It's a very easy syntax. This says if x and, and for all x and for all y, the sum of x and y equals the sum of y of x. That's commutivity. And this is the definition of the inclusion thing, right? It's as simple as it can be. And then there's the proposition 12. Uh, basically, it says if y is in z, uh, then the sum of x and y is in the sum of x and z. What I want to show you today now in, is talk in more specific terms about how I'm using computational methods to actually improve the ontology that I've been working on. And I'm going to now tell you about the axioms and theorems of object theory, which is a theory of abstract objects that's described axiomatically. And for this crowd, um, there's several ways to think about what it, what it is. First of all, it's a way to systematize any abstract object that any philosopher or scientist ever needs. That is, the idea is that in science, we use mathematics, we use possible events, a probability space, is a, you're assigning probabilities to possible events, you talk about properties of things, uh, and, and, we, and in linguistics, you use the type versus token distinction, where types are abstract things. Uh, we use uh, moments of time. In modal logic, we use possible worlds. Um, and, co and in cognitive science, we have the notion of concept. So there are all these abstract things that people postulate. I'd like to organize them in one theory. So that's one way to thinking about what object theory is. A second way is that there's a group the main distinction that object theory involves is the distinction between exemplifying and encoding a property. And when you an object that encodes a property is going to be abstract, and by encoding a property, it can, give the, it can capture the representational content of a state of mind in which you're thinking about a world that exemplifies, things in the world that exemplify those properties. So Fragian senses can be modeled in a very nice way, and there's a way to handle failures of substitution and belief reports thinking about non-existent things and abstract things in general. And so object theory is a way of thinking about uh, doing it that way, a, a way of systematizing that, that work. And as I said, the main idea in object theory is that you add this new formula, atomic formula, X encodes F, to a classical second order S5 quantified modal logic without identity. And you add, some, you add definite descriptions and lambda expressions where those are interpreted relationally. And this whole formalism, formalism involves primitive variables ranging over individuals and primitive variables ranging over relations. I don't interpret the Fs as functions from worlds to individuals or as sets of individuals. They're primitive relations. And of course, I owe you a theory of what those relations are. And that's part of the theory. But I'm not going to get involved in that too much today unless you're really concerned about it. The idea behind encoding is that if you think about the history of mathematics, mathematicians tried to use principles to just characterize objects whose only properties are their mathematical properties. And, this, uh, 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 and Selmer had that idea. You just take the axioms of number theory, and that's really all there is to number theory. Well, actually, what object theory does is it says, you give me the axioms, and I'll put out objects whose only encoded properties 
are the properties that they encode according to that are exemplified in that theory, relative to that theory. So you give me the principles that are the theorems that are true of an object in that theory, and you can abstract out an object that encodes all those things. So that's what encoding is for. And it allows objects that are abstract that encode properties to be complete with respect to the properties they exemplify. They're not buildings, they're not red, they're not spatiotemporal. All those things, they are properties they exemplify, but what they encode is just their mathematical properties, or in the case of other abstract objects, just their defining properties. So I define ordinary objects as things, I take a primitive predicate, E bang, and I read it as concreteness. So ordinary objects are possibly concrete, and abstract objects are not the kind of thing that could be concrete. And then the fundamental comprehension principle underlying the theory of abstract objects is an unrestricted comprehension principle that says, give me any description phi that picks out a bunch of properties. There's an abstract object that encodes all and only those Fs that satisfy phi. And we'll see some examples in just a minute. But given classic, and, and I also take classical lambda conversion where this is interpreted rate relationally to mean X1 through Xn exemplify, this is an exemplification formula, this relation being a Y1 through Yn such that phi star, if and only if X1 through Xn satisfy phi, where phi star has no description here, and it has no free encoding formulas, that's what the star means, no, sub, no encoding subformulas. And that gives you, you can derive from that comprehension for relations and so that this formula, the, these two principles are going to figure prominently a little bit later. Here are some other principles of the theory, namely that ordinary objects don't encode properties and necessarily, that if you encode a property possibly you necessarily encode it, and that ordinary objects are identical whenever they necessarily exemplify the same, exemplify the same properties, whereas abstract are, objects are identical whenever they necessarily encode the same properties. So now, given this principle of comprehension for abstract objects and this principle for identity for abstract objects, turns out that a certain group of definite descriptions in the theory become canonical. They're always well-defined no matter what phi you put in there. Because no matter what phi you put in there, this, there's going to be a unique abstract object that encodes exactly the property satisfying phi because there couldn't be two distinct abstract objects that encode exactly the properties satisfying phi because distinct abstract objects have to decipher what be, have to be distinguished by one of their encoded properties. So these, proper, these definite descriptions become canonical. So let's see how we can use them. So this is just a selection of some of the objects I've examined in various papers, and I haven't put down the papers. If you're interested, you can look them up. In the paper with Pelletier, we we identified Plato's form of the triangle as the abstract object that encodes all those Fs that are necessarily implied by the property of being a triangle. So it's, the form of the triangle just encodes being a triangle and anything implied by that, necessarily implied by that, and nothing else. It's pure triangularity and nothing else. So it's not isosceles, it's not equilateral, it doesn't have a certain length to the sides. But nevertheless, it is a triangle. It's got three sides, three interior angles. The interior angle sub sum to 180 degrees. So that's how it's a pure object. Uh, a, a pure object. Uh, uh, may, you might want to think of it as the concept of triangle as well. And then Leibniz had these ideas, uh, the complete individual concepts for things like the concept of Alexander. That becomes the abstract object that encodes exactly the properties F, such that Alexander exemplifies F. And that you can then produce such a thing. It's guaranteed to exist for anything other than Alexander, for anything, any object mm -hmm. Y. There's going to be a Leibnizian concept of it. Frege had Frege numbers. Those become abstract objects. So the number, the Frege number zero becomes the abstract object that encodes all the properties F uh, that are unexemplified properties. All, it encodes all the unexemplified properties. And one encodes all those properties F such that there's exactly one thing that falls under that property where that's spelled out logically speaking. Then the truth values, these are things that Frege postulated, everybody just seems to accept in logic. The true is an abstract, the abstract object that encodes all and only the truths by encoding properties of this form. And the false is an ab the abstract object that encodes all and only the falsehoods. So that now you, get, you can prove theorems about the true and the false, you can prove theorems about Frege numbers, about all these things. And similarly, the, the idea of a situation is being an object that every property that it encodes is a propositional type property, and so you define P is true at S to mean S encodes this propositional property, being a Y such that P, 
in a possible world then becomes possibly an object that possibly makes true all and only the truths. And from that, you get the Leibniz, the, the Leibniz Kripke principle that P is necessary if true in all worlds, and you can derive the Lewis principle. I call this the Lewis principle because Lewis said, for every way a world might be, there is a world which is that way. This is a mantra in the, on the plurality of worlds, so he has the left to right direction, but the right to left direction is derivable as well. And then generally speaking, mathematical objects are abstracted out from their inferential role in the theory. So, or, or however you want to think of them, uh, I, they become the, the null set of ZF, for example. You give me all the theorems of ZF, you bring them into object theory as truths of this abstract object which encodes just propositions. So ZF itself becomes an abstract thing that encodes content. It encodes just propositions. And so you bring in all the theorems. So mathematicians make judgments that the null set exemplifies F in ZF, where that's a model, uh, where that's a, a proof theoretic symbol, and I bring it in, in as an analytic truth with a model theoretic symbol, where that's defined as here, and then the null set becomes the abstract object that encodes all and only those properties F that, that the null set exemplifies in ZF. So I've abstracted out, and you can do this for any arbitrary mathematical object in any arbitrary mathematical theory. So Mathematical objects now become part of the thing. So now we've got these applications of object theory. Um, so now the interesting thing about object theory is then is, is it consistent? I mean, it seems like it's a powerful system. And uh, in fact, it's got very tiny models. And it becomes really powerful as soon as you start applying it. It gets bigger and bigger models as soon as you start applying it. But the object theory doesn't even demand that there's more than one possible world. It allows just like in every modal logic. The small, in a modal logic, you can interpret it with the domain of at least one possible world. And when there's just one possible world, you get modal collapse and all that kind of thing. But the interesting thing is that there is a paradox that object theory avoids with this condition, no encoding subformulas and building new properties. And it was first observed by Clark in a paper in 78, and Boulos discovered it independently in a paper on Frege. Basically, the idea is this. And the reason I'm going into this is because computational methods, after I had gotten rid of this paradox by banishing encoding subformulas, they crept in through the back door. And when I reformulated the theory in a fully general way, and that was discovered by computational methods by Daniel Kirshner. And I'll, that's what I'm about to explain now. That's, the, that's really of interest to me. Because, you know, saving, I mean, if Frege had computational methods at his disposal in 1893, he would not have published the Grundgesetze because he could have found the paradox, right? So, so unfortunately, uh, he was not in the same position we are. So here's the idea. Suppose you could build a property. Suppose comprehension for properties allowed you to assert the existence of a property F who's exemplified by all and only those objects X such that there's a property that X encodes but doesn't exemplify. Or suppose you could build the lambda expression that it had this encoding formula, which is basically the same formula as this. You could bind that variable x by the lambda. Well, call this property k, so that by lambda conversion, or just by instantiating that to k, it follows that something is k if and only if there's a property that you encode, but you don't exemplify. Well, then consider the abstract object that encodes just that property k. You can build an object that encodes a property. Well, Call that object A. A encodes F if and only if F is equal to K. Ask the question, does A exemplify K? Well, suppose it does. Well, then by A, there's a property, say P, such that A encodes P and not, doesn't exemplify P. But A encodes P implies P equals K. Hence, A doesn't exemplify K. Alternatively, suppose not, suppose A doesn't encode K, then by A, it follows that every property that A encodes is one that it exemplifies. But by B, we know K is self-identical, so A is going to encode it. So that follows that A exemplifies K, all right? Because every property that it encodes, it exemplifies, and we've just established that it encodes K. So puzzle, paradox. So when I formulated, I was aware of the Clark uh, 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 paradox, and I built object theory. I explicitly ruled it out so as to not build new properties. So the thing is that when you have a complex a system like mine, where you have both two kinds of terms, lambda expressions and definite descriptions, 
you have a choice. How are you going to interpret lambda expressions that contain definite descriptions where the definite description might fail to denote? And when I was first working on the theory, I actually only imagined one way of doing it. I thought to myself, well, if the description doesn't denote anything, then how can the lambda expression denote something? I assume, wrongly it turns out, that if a part of the, of the formula failed to denote, then the whole term was going to denote. If, the, if a part of the matrix fails to denote, then the whole term was going to fail to denote. So by doing that, uh, it turns out that all you need to do is get, add a no descriptions restriction on forming relations. And actually, you can avoid another problem by doing that. Because when you do that, you can avoid the prob this problem, which is if the, the x such that psi doesn't denote anything, the left side is false. Because the left side here uh, says that this uh, a exemplifies a property which in fact doesn't denote anything because here this thing doesn't denote. Whereas the right side's true because it's the negation of a falsehood. Because if the x such that phi doesn't denote, then, sorry, then the right side, the, getting rid of the negation side, by Russell's th theory of the descriptions, this atomic formula is false, so the right side's true. So I thought, oh great, so let's just get rid of uh, little, uh, descriptions, and if you want to put them back in, you can, you can prove that they exist, and then you can instantiate them back in. But then I realized that that semantics is kind of restrictive, and there's a much more general semantics where you can interpret the denotation of a lambda expression in terms of the truth conditions of phi star rather than the denotation of its terms. So in that case, then this relation, this expression can denote something. Namely, it will denote a, a universal property that everything x exemplifies because in this case, this will be false because that fails to denote, the whole thing will be false, but then that will be true. It's not the case that x bears r to that. And so being an x such that the true, the, such that the true holds is, uh, is going to give that thing a, 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 a denotation. So you can have this principle as long as you interpret lambda expressions that way. So I thought, OK, I can eliminate the no descriptions ban and the free logic of lambda expressions. But I did that sort of in an unpublished publication, and then Daniel Kirchner and Benz Muller, these two computer scientists at, uh, at the university in Berlin, they, used, they implemented object theory in Isabel Hull, which is a higher order uh, reasoning system. It, 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 uh, it's uh, interactive, and they, they basically validated a lot of things, but they started off with this unpublished work where I was just trying out this new idea. And then they discovered that, Daniel discovered in his master's thesis, that um, <clears throat> there's still a loophole, a back door for the paradox to get to reestablish itself. Namely, if you allow encoding formulas that are buried within a description, those aren't officially subformulas of the whole formula, because subformula has to do with molecular structure. And so as long as the description has that, sub, that encoding formula, this becomes a legitimate lambda expre expression. And he found that he could get the clark bulos paradox back if you build this lambda expression. I know it looks god awful to read. But when g is a universal property, it turns out you can show that this property leads to a contradiction. Or this property, you can instantiate it by comprehension. See, we don't need to look at the details unless you're really interested. But the fact is, what's important here is that using the computational computational techniques, we discovered that these properties are still there in the system unless you take explicit steps to rule them out. Fortunately, when you do rule them out, uh, no, you don't lose any important theorems. But the theory would have been, uh, uh, would have been inconsistent. And, so, and there's a proof here if you want. And I can send you the slides if you're interested in seeing exactly how these details go. This proof is a, real, is a simplification of many, many lines of code that's in basically a kind of a, a, a clausal normal form where, where they gets rid of all the quantifiers and uh, they use only free variables and they use skolem functions uh, to replace the existential quantifiers and binary and tertiary functions, depend, skolem functions, depending on how many uh, quantifiers the exec, existential quantifier is nested under. So anyway, I've simplified it and boiled it down to the minimum. But that's the main thing that you need to take away is that uh, the computational techniques really saved our bacon, so to speak. And this is a, so let's see. I'm supposed to talk. Uh, I want to finish by.
in, fifth, in, in, in eight or 10 minutes if I can. So let me see if I can do that. Um, so yes, so, so I went back and added the little restriction that was needed because they discovered this paradox. And in thinking about that description, I realized there's a fundamental idea about object theory that allows us to do something that we hadn't been able to do before. Namely, reconsider how free logic is formulated. Now, um, the, basically, the principles of free logic, and here I'm going to say what they are in sort of a mixed f uh, material, formal and material mode. Normally, in the, in the formal mode, you would say a term has a denotation. But when you jump inside the theory, you're saying whether something exists or not. And typically, in a free logic, you define the existence of a term or the denotation of a term just in case there's something that's identical to that thing. That's a standard move in free logic. And then you assert as axioms, you revise quantification theory so that if everything is such that phi, then if tau has a denotation or if tau exists, then tau is such that phi. And then you assert that constants, variables, and description-free terms all have denotations, and you assert it this way. And then you assert that if there's an atomic formula that's true, well, that means all the terms and the main terms in the atomic formula have to denote. So then you add this. But then I asked myself, why not define exi Why didn't they define existence in terms of predication? After all, predication is deeper than identity because we've identified, we've defined identity in terms of predication. Well, the reason I realized was this. It doesn't generalize from the first to the second order case. If you were to define Obama exists as there is a property that Obama exemplifies, or the, king, the present king of France exists means there's a property that the present king of France exemplifies. Of course, this now turns out to be false because that's false because that doesn't denote anything. There's, there's no property that that thing exemplifies, so you can't have a true formula in which the present king of France appears. <clears throat> but, so it works in the first place, in the first order case, but in the second order case, for a property, you can't say for a property to exist, there's an object that exemplifies it because that doesn't work for all the properties that are uninstantiated. You can't just say something like this because un unexemplified properties undermines the generalization. So you can't define identity in terms of predication and use free logic uh, in, a, in a second order setting. But in object theory, there's two kinds of predication and identity is not primitive and both notions can be defined independently and one can then prove that a term exists just if and only if uh, there is something which is identical to it. So, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over the details here because here the details, uh, the details explain how the definitions of identities are reduced to, def to predications. And then I show, uh, I just give a summary that you can prove all the things that uh, the, the free logicians want, uh, except you don't take identity as a primitive and you don't use that in your axiom. So instead, you use in your axioms. This notion here, which is just means the, the term exists, but it's now defined in terms of purely predicational terms. So there's a so thinking about f f results that computational methods help produce help me to find a, a nice, elegant reformulation of the theory. Okay, last two couple of minutes, I want to talk about one last thing, and, uh, and that should leave us plenty of time for questions. And that's how computational methods lead you to improve. Uh, epistemology. It's a, it's a, we've now seen how these use of automated reasoning engines have helped improve our work in metaphysics. I think the consequences are, for epistemology are clear. It goes without saying that when we detect errors in reasoning, we're in a better position epistemologically speaking. The proofs produced by automated reasoning engines can sometimes help us better understand a complex argument despite the complexity of the engine's output. And the automated reasoning engines help us to quickly see the consequences of alternative versions of our theory and the, which conclusions are undermined by revising one premise and which new conclusions can be drawn by adding a new premise. And all that really helps us from an epistemological point of view, determining what axiom set we think are the, are the best ones for a given set of data. And in filing, finding smaller premise sets, uh, we can focus our mind and reduce the epistemological load needed to demonstrate soundness, for example. Right? You have a smaller premise set. Well, to show your theory is sound uh, and consistent, well, it's an easier task. So that's what computational methods help us to do. But there's one really other important thing that helps us epistemologically with these computational methods. 
It's just a philosophical platitude. People have said it all the time that David Lewis has a large ontology. He called this, you know, this is the, the incredulous stare. I've gotten this incredulous stare too because people who think about my applied theory think that it's a big applied ontology. And if you treat the quantifier as Meinongian, it looks like it's a bunch of mainstream objects, though. If you treat the quantifier as Quine said we should, well, then it becomes a big kind of superplatonism. Um, but the point is, is that you know, these philosophical platitudes are all based on certain applied versions of the theory. But what computational methods show is what the minimal models are of the unapplied versions of your theory. And it won't be the fault of the theory if when you apply it, it grows. You want to look at what the unapplied versions of the theory say. So the fundamental theory of his theory of possible, fundamental principle of his theory of possible worlds, as I mentioned earlier, for every way a world might be, there is a world which is that way. And in object theory, it becomes this. Uh, this is the left to right direction of that the theorem. And it turns out you can show using these model theoretic techniques and the computational methods that, that this is true in a domain containing just two possible worlds and even in a domain containing one possible world. And Brandon and I showed that in 2007 and that led Chris Menzel and I to look at a, this in really some detail to see what it was that was driving these tiny models. So Lewis's ontology only grows when you add ordinary modal beliefs. But his theoretical views imply only a small ontology. So you don't, and what it tells us is that if you prove, you, you prove facts about possible worlds this way, you don't need the epistemic access to all the objects in Lewis's ontology. All you need to do is show that the theoretical principle follows from very general philosophical principles. And then all you, then all you need to do to prove the existence of particular non-actual uh, non possible worlds is to add things, your modal beliefs that are false but possibly true, like there might have been talking donkeys. As Soon as you add that, your theory generates the right possible world where talking donkeys exist. If you add your belief that there are no, there, that there it might have been million carat diamonds, then you know, your, the theory now generates an object. You don't have to say there's some special epistemic access to those things. And that's basically what I think is one of the main value, one of the principal virtues of doing things computationally. It helps us to see exactly what the commitments of our theories are and where we can let things slide from an epistemological point of view. Thanks very much. Good. I, I got, did it in 45 minutes. We had 15 minutes. Yes. Let me, let me put the slides that have, uh, that advance by slide rather than by bullet point. Uh, and that way, um, did I do that right? Let's see if I did that right. Okay, I, now I can advance by slide. Yes? How do you envision the uh, division of labor? Uh, between, you know, the human philosopher or uh, religion and... Uh, Cognitive scientists? Uh, no, no, and the crew, uh, those uh, machines. Oh. That, uh, we will do, you know, the conceptual work, you know, uh, formulate the hypothesis and just let, let the, the machines uh, prove it for us or... Uh, well, well, look, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I just see it as a tool. I mean, the, to help us... And, and eventually, you know, if you were to use my system as some sort of background, so if you're going to build an artificially intelligent agent, let's say, and you want it to be able to talk philosophy, then you've got to give it some sort of represent, at some level of, of level of abstraction, there's got to be a representation of the world. And I offer these axioms as a way of giving a representation of the, the, you know, the way the world is, and we can talk intelligibly about possible worlds and things like that. But uh, as a philosopher, I can only get so far. Sometimes I don't see the consequences of all the things I add as axioms. And the machine helps me figure out, if I don't see it right away, it can sometimes help me from falling into error. So it's just a tool. Uh, and, and, but, but if you're building an artificially intelligent agent, it can help the agent reason, right? So that, then it has a different application. It's actually, and my wife, my wife works at Google, and she says, unfortunately, we don't, we don't have a lot of automated reasoning going on. We don't use a lot of reasoning tools. We're building mostly representational tools and making the knowledge graph and the Google Assistant, Android Assistant go. And but I think eventually you're going to need to add 
these automated reasoning tools to, so that your artificially intelligent agents can reason and produce things and things like that. Thank you very much. Uh, great, great talk. Uh, my question actually does relate directly to the forms. Uh, I'm trying to understand the, the, the mindset differences and purposes uh, in what you're doing uh, versus, say, um, a linguistically focused. So, you know, Montague, uh, that, that'll get dangerous because you kind of swallow that up. But let's say, generically, a formal linguist. Yeah. Now, the formal linguist is, is uh, time and time again impressed by, by, by specimens, and sure. specimen after specimen. Sure. And then the specimen limits to other specimens because there'd be, there'd be some inferential stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, that's not what you're doing. No. What you're doing also is not the same thing as uh, the AI person who directly needs for each application to drive this robot to do this. Right. So what you, what you did in response to one of them was, was it's, it's a future oriented and very coherent response. If you eventually want, for example, your robots to philosophize, pay attention to me now because if you try to back up and do that 10 years ago, <laughs> you'll, you'll have a lot of catching up to you. But you see the third camp, right? Sure. The third camp, now that's the camp on Sure, you. sure. You want to build a cognitive representation that it can compute over. Uh, right. For, for, for given robots, given AIs, given applications. Yeah. All right, well, it's why you can do it. So if, if you accept this basic naive so, so a lot of problems is screw over that. But then, then my question is, okay, from my perspective in the third camp, when I look at the machinery of reason, I see very few low operators. At this point, I'm just using one. Well, I, I, I know. So, <laughs> what I'm so the things I see formally that, that I am puzzling over are I see very few low operators. And I see I certainly see no infinitary constructions in the syntax. And I see no third order because the second order quantified yeah. the logic. And yeah. there, well, that, that, that's, that's one mode of operator because they're interchangeable by occasion. So, so what, what about that third What is your attitude about the need for more? I see no incompatibility here. There's no incompatibility. It's just a matter of bringing the two projects together and adding the kinds of primitive notions and axioms that you need in a framework that's like this, which is, can be extended in ways that you've extended it. And in fact, I have extended it to higher order, but beyond, and in fact, I, because the, the, the uh, let's see, uh, let's see, keep going here. If you do a type theory version of object theory so that at every type, logical type, there are abstract and ordinary things of that type. Then you can build a representation not only of the null set of ZF, but the membership relation of ZF. It becomes an abstract relation that encodes the properties of relations that are attributed to the membership relation in ZF. And, that, and then you can abstract over this. So there's no incompatibility there, and there's all sorts of ways of bringing the two together, though I think uh, at some point, if you really want to capture the content of a lot of co cognitive states, you're going to need some abstract objects uh, at, at some point because a lot of our cognitive beliefs are about things that just aren't in the world. The other thing is that I'm not doing is that I'm not from a formal linguist. The formal linguists help themselves to all this mathematics, functional type theory, set theory, all this kind of stuff. That's fine, but what they're doing ultimately is then building a model of the world and not a theory of the world because all, no piece of language other than the mathematical language denotes a set. Yet, if you look at any formal linguistics paper, basically all the things in the language end up denoting sets because they're using model theory and set theory to kind of represent the things. And that's fine. That's exactly what they should be doing. But they have to understand that's not a description of the world. That's just a model of the world. What I'm trying to build is a theory of the world, something that somebody intelligent could use as part of an explanation of things, right? Of ultimately, we got to focus on explanation. This is a big problem with data mining and machine learning and all this stuff. The level of explanation almost never gets, you, you never see enough information uh, or, or, or 
people pay enough respect to how it is that we explain things to one another. And of course, this has big consequences for you know, the European requirement that black box machines ought to be able to explain why they make the decisions they do. So that's why you need a theory, I think, and not simply a model of the world to do it. And uh, so uh, th that's another difference between me and Mr. Well, I was saying we need proofs sure. for elimination. Sure. You're taking, as I, as I see it, you're, you're taking models from the world that are first order, basic first order conception of what a model is. The provers are first order. No, 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 no. The provers aren't for it. That, that was just what I started with. Now the provers are all higher order. Isabel Hole is a higher order reasoning engine. And that's the correct way to represent this language. Representing this language in a first order theorem prover is a mess. It's just terrible. I would not recommend that. Uh, we struggled a lot to do it. In fr First order provers have certain advantages. They, they can discover proofs because there's a first order unification algorithm. But there's no second order unification algorithm. And so the, the higher order theorem provers can't actually always find proofs when there are such. And so, so we, I, we tended to avoid those. Yeah. If I can say one more thing about the, the, not just the linguists. I had a very interesting conversation with uh, Peter Yardenfors just a few days ago because there was another conference here in Warsaw hosted by the philosophy department that brought together linguists and cognitive sciences and philosophers. It was called, this, it was the second conference on uh, context, cognition, and communication. Some of you were in attendance. Peter gave a keynote and I gave a keynote and they, they were about concepts but completely different conceptions of concepts. And the interesting thing was that we recognized that they were not incompatible. Why? Because this whole formalism I built on the basis of Judgments of logical consequence. I looked around and I said, look, the ancient Greeks worshiped Zeus, therefore they worshiped something. That's a consequence relation. We all agree to that. So let's build a formalism that preserves that inference. Or A has property F and A has property G, therefore there's a something, uh, sorry, uh, and B has property F, therefore there's a property G that both A and B exemplify. Let's, that's a consequence relation that I wanted to preserve in the system. And those are all get preserved. So I built the formalism by pattern matching, trying to build a formal system that pattern matched to these consequence relations. But what the cognitive scientists are doing are explaining why is it that we make those logical consequence judgments? Whereas I'm taking them as given and building a formalism that, brought, that systematizes them. And eventually, that just means the two are going to sh show up. I mean, they're at an implementation detail that they're trying to explain how we get into a state where we make those judgments. And I'm saying, OK, given that there are, those judgments are made, here's a formalism that, that allows us to have another layer of implementation detail, namely the reasoning system. Because he doesn't get the reasoning system at the lower level, but he gets that only emerges after you've got the judgments and the concepts and things of this kind. So I think it's a nice way of seeing that there's no fundamental incompatibility between what the logicians and philosophers are doing and what the cognitive scientists are doing, and what the linguists are doing. In many ways, they're all working on different aspects, the same problem. Uh, somebody wanted to follow up on, the, on that point. Uh, there, you may be jumping the queue, but is it a follow up on this point? Um, yeah, I think so. But you mentioned type theory. I was just going to ask you, I was just going to ask you, because you mentioned type theory, how object theory relates to type theory. Type theory? Yeah. I just take type theory as a, as a kind of like all the other logicians do. I just introduce types uh, in a certain way. I use, um, just take a, the types to be symbols. Uh, and so what I do is I, I say, let I be the type for individuals. And then I say, for any types T1 and Tn, there's a complex type. And that's the type for relations. Among, uh, among entities having types T1 through Tn. I just use those types, let them be symbols of a certain kind, type, to types of this, symbol types, <laughs> where that's explained as abstract objects as well. But then I type the syntax and I type the semantics. If you want to give a semantics for this, and you can give a semantics assuming some mathematics, uh, for those people who want to show that the theory is consistent, I'd say fine, use some mathematics. Uh, and, and, but then the domains get typed as well. So type theory can be, is developed, and if you ask me what the types are, well, I'd say they are 
abstract objects that encode the properties that tokens have to have in order to be of that type. So, yeah. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you.